Women's are much more of a moving target. And if you don't like the mood of the woman sitting next to you right now, just wait two and a half days and it'll change. <laughs> because that's how often our hormones surge as well. And depending on where we're at in our cycle might also depend on the responses that you get from us. So when a woman is ovulating, around that time we are much more sociable, we become social butterflies, we're much more empathetic, we're much more connected, uh, we're much more articulate as well, so our words per minute ratio goes up dramatically and we can be very convincing at getting what we want. Our libido also increases and you know you can leave your socks on the floor every single night and it won't bother us and we're still happy to baby make, right? It's for evolutionary purposes. But then when it's close to menstruation, it's a bit of a different story. Sometimes the opposite can be true. So medicine has failed women. And our female body is now seen like this medicalized war zone that there's always a problem. So as soon as we start menstruating, we're put on the pill. And then you'll stay on that until you're ready to have babies and you'll come off. But because you've been on it for so long, now you'll need IVF or fertility medication. And then once you get to menopause, we'll give you HRT until you can't stand it anymore. And then we'll just whip out those organs because you don't need them. Or once we hit 40, it's all downhill from there, right? It's a dried up road until imminent Alzheimer's or dementia. And then it's all over. Sounds pretty ridiculous, right? Sounds ridiculous. But the sad truth is that every minute of every day, a woman is having a hysterectomy and only one in 10 of those are actually for life-saving medical purposes. So expert gynecologists have a saying that there's no room in the tomb for the womb. Or if they take out a healthy uterus, it's given a medicalized acronym called CPU, which means chronic persistent uterus. So all that means is that it was perfectly healthy, but it was still there. Can you imagine if every minute of every day, men were having their testicles removed? It's unconscionable, right? <laughs> Medicine has failed women, and the only options that they offer us are things like hormonal contraceptives, synthetic hormones, HRT, or surgery. There has to be a better way. So when we're stressed, we're pretty unhappy, right? And one of the hormones that kicks in is cortisol. And cortisol is a bit of a bossy hormone. It uses other hormones or robs other hormones to make more of it because it's, your body will sacrifice other things when we're under stress. So as cortisol goes up, one of the hormones that it uses to make more of it is progesterone, the hormone that kicks in in that second phase of our cycle. It's what I like to call nature's Valium. So it's supposed to keep us really beautifully level-headed. And isn't it interesting that this is kicking in two weeks before we get our period. This is usually when women are turning into monsters as well. And this is because of this stress cycle, so stay tuned. Now, because our body has to work like this beautiful symphony orchestra of balance, if something goes down, then something else must come up. So when we've got lower progesterone, something else becomes dominant and that is estrogen. And oestrogen is that beautiful feminizing hormone that develops our boobs and our butt. It gives us the nice tight skin. Uh, it makes our bones really strong. Uh, makes our memory amazing. This is why guys can't forget. We won't let you forget anything. Uh, but it also makes us not entirely spatially aware too. So we can't read a map, but we won't forget anything. <laughs> and when oestrogen becomes dominant, there's a few things that tend to happen. So often we will gain weight and that excess body tissue is its own endocrine producing organ. So we put on you know, more weight and then we're producing more estrogen. And all of a sudden we've got all of these things happening in our system. And once estrogen gets to a point, it suppresses our thyroid function. And your thyroid is involved in your body temperature, your metabolism, your gut function, your brain function, so many things. But now we've got an underactive thyroid, so we're probably putting on more weight. And again, this extra, extra body fat is producing more toxic levels of estrogen. So this vicious cycle is continuing. Now guys, you're not exempt from this. So when men get stressed, they also are producing higher levels of estrogen. And their body actually converts testosterone into estrogen. And this is when we see things like man boobs and muffin tops and our beautifully stoic men become losing their emotional resilience. And then once our thyroid's kicked out, all of a sudden we've got all of these hormones recycling through our body, just like bad karma, <laughs> putting pressure on our liver and our gut, 
in a system that can't get rid of it, and now we've got digestive issues too, and that makes us pretty unhappy. Can you see how stress directly screws with your hormones? And so one of the things that happened to me five years ago um, is that I got divorced. And it was a big deal for me. It was a really challenging, challenging time. And one of the reasons it was so challenging is that it fed into a lot of beliefs that I had around myself and a lot of beliefs that I'd had around myself from a very young age, okay? And so one day I sat down and I started investigating these beliefs and I had my little journal out and I just started writing stuff. And what came into my head was that this fundamental belief that I had, and to a degree a fundamental belief, belief that I still have sometimes, is that I'm not good enough. Who shares that? Who's ever felt like they're not good enough? It is so common. As far as limiting beliefs go, it seems to be the most common limiting belief that we can have. And so at this time in my life especially, but to be honest, it wasn't really even related to the time in my life. It had been there probably my entire life. I had some limiting beliefs. And when I started writing them down, I just started writing a list of all of these beliefs that I had, okay? And so I wrote down that I'm not good enough as a husband. I wrote down that I'm not good enough as a chiropractor. I wrote down that I'm not good enough at managing my money. I wrote down that I'm not good enough at looking after my kids. I wrote down that I'm not good enough at getting my message out and sharing what I know with as many people as I could. And I just had a, I just kept going. I was like, this list just kept going. Doesn't it sound like the most depressing, sad thing you could do is sit down and write a list of why you're not good enough? And I got to the end of my not good enough list and I felt fantastic. It was the most relieved I have felt in the longest period of time. Because for the first time in a very long time, I was totally honest with myself. I was honest about all these things that I'd been saying to myself in my head, but I hadn't been allowing to come to the surface because I was scared of what would happen if they actually came, if I actually admitted that I said those things about myself, I was scared of where that would go. Who can relate to that? this idea that maybe there's someone out there who's going to save us. Maybe it's someone else's responsibility to change. Maybe we need to wait for someone to come along and give us what we need to make that step in the next direction. That maybe everyone else should care enough about us to help us make this change. The reality is no one else is going to care enough about you to help you make this change until you care enough about you to help you make this change. Okay? We can give you tools, we can give you resources, we can give you information, hopefully we can give you inspiration, but we can't make the change for you. The change has to come from within and it has to come from you guys. Okay? We are not your gurus. We are not the people who are going to heal you, save you, fix you. If you want to find that person, look in the mirror. But the problem with truth is our perception of what truth is. We have this idea that truth is this absolute, finite, definite thing that exists somewhere. And it doesn't. There's no such thing as absolute truth. And when you go searching for absolute truth, and when you want everything to be absolute truth, you are absolutely setting yourself up for failure. Okay? So what I want you to understand, if there is no one truth, there's your truth. Okay? And even your truth isn't true. All it is, is the best model you can come up with right now to help explain what's going on until you learn something new and replace it with a better one. That's your truth. And when you start thinking about truth in that way, it's so liberating. It frees you from the pressure of needing to be right. It frees you from the pressure of needing to know what to do. It frees you from the pressure of needing to know how to do it. And it frees you from beating yourself up. I'm from Sydney, living in Cronulla, and I'd been with my partner for eight months, eight, eight years, sorry. And we were having some trouble in our relationship. And I got a text message on my phone one morning when I'd stayed at my girlfriend's place one Sunday night. And the text message was really strange and very odd to me. So my girlfriend Jody, she was the best friend I've ever had. She said to me, come on, Kaza, jump in the car. We're going to go around to your house. And we lived five minutes away. I just stayed at her house that night. We passed an ambulance on the way to my house and my partner, Greg, had committed suicide. He gassed himself in his car on the Sunday night of the 14th of October, 2001. 
I roll up into my driveway and I'm met by a police officer who says to me, are you Karen Smith? And I said, I am. What's happened? And he said, Karen, Greg committed suicide last night. And the only way that we knew was that your neighbor's father committed suicide exactly the same way. And he heard Greg start his car at 8, at 8, 8 p.m. and it was still running at 8 a.m. the next morning. And so he put two and two together. Now I fell to my knees because I am just like you. I'm just a kid inside. Feels like there's a seven year old inside of me. There's nothing adult about me and you can probably tell, but there's nothing adult about me and I'm just like you. So I fell to my knees and I didn't know what to do with that. How do you live with that? And the police officer handed me Kylie Minogue's CD, Can't Get You Out of My Head. Do you guys remember that song? Greg had that set to repeat in his car during the process of, his, of him taking his life. And it takes about 15 minutes to take your life in that manner. So he was thinking of me the whole time. And I reread his suicide message where he said he was sorry that he wasn't enough for me. And he was sorry that he couldn't be there for me, but that he would be watching over me all the time. And he said he was sorry that he wasn't the right person for me. And our relationship was struggling, make no mistake about it, but I had no idea that that's what he was thinking. You know, in my mind, in my mind, Greg was this tower of strength. He was the kind of guy that if he didn't like you, man, you knew it, like straight away. And I didn't have the courage to be that kind of person. And he was strong and he was so handsome. And I never thought that he would be the one that would take his life. It just didn't occur to me that that would be a possibility. But what that did was plummet me into the depths of depression and the depths of despair where I had to live with the guilt of knowing that he had taken his life because of me. So as the weeks and the days went on, I became more and more depressed and more and more disassociated from reality. So much so that the thought of taking my own life was the only thing that actually made sense to me. I had no comprehension that I'd be putting my family through the same thing that I was going through. All I was looking for was a way out. And we know through our studies around suicide is when pain exceeds the ability to cope, the person vacates the room. And I had vacated the room well and truly. It was beyond my ability to cope. And 12 months rolled around and I'd made a decision for myself. I couldn't stand the sight of myself. I couldn't stand who I was. I couldn't stand what I'd done. So I made a decision that on his anniversary, on the 14th of October, 2002, I would take my own life and I would end it all and I would pay my price for what I had done to him and his family. And I would exit the life of my family who are watching the living dead walking around. And finally, I'd be back in my rightful place with Greg, which was the only thing that made sense. So on the 12th of October, 2002, I boarded a plane to Bali, which was where I had my sinister plans all laid out. And my two girlfriends, Jody and another girlfriend, Charmaine, decided to join us. And if that date's ringing a bell for those of you who haven't heard me speak before, that's the date of the 2002 Bali bombing. That night we were in the Sari Club, the bomb went off at 11.30. I was blown backwards into a pit and Jody and Charmaine were blown forwards into the bar where there were four gas tanks that subsequently exploded, which was why nobody stood a chance at the front of the Sari Club. The only reason I survived was because all of the bodies landed on top of me. And when I came to, I woke up with hands across my face, feet and legs across my body, and no one was moving. I heard a voice in my head telling me that I needed to get out, so I managed to get myself out and onto the street. And when I got onto the street, I was rescued. <laughs> I tell you, I'd been in Bali for about three or four hours, and a big fat Australian guy on a moped named Jeff Smithers pulls up, g'day doll. Look, you're in a bit of strife. You're going to need to get on the back of me moped. And I reckon I'll take you to the local hospital. And I can tell you now, the Aussie Yobbo went from there to there, in my estimation. He was amazing. I wrapped my arms around his big beer belly and he took me to the hospital. He dodged traffic. He was up and down um, gutters. He was amazing. Finally got me to the local hospital where they laid me out and inserted six drips in my arms because I'd lost a fair amount of blood because what I didn't realize was the entire left side of my skull was completely crushed in. And I had no idea. There was no pain. They cleaned out the wound and I received 38 staples from here 
to here with no anaesthetic. I never felt a thing. For those of you guys who are feeling like you're gonna gag, I never felt a thing, but I heard it. As each one went through. <laughs> so I still cringe at the, feel, <laughs> the thought of it. And another Australian guy, Phil Morgan, picked me up off the table with his big, he had one of those blue trucky singlets on, like all so very Australian. <laughs> and these blue trucky singlet, and he was part of the Australian Federal Police that was there on holidays, and all of a sudden he was kicked into high gear to save us all. And thanks to him and the efforts of a whole bunch of other people, I managed to board a plane to fly home to Sydney that night. The hospital had told me, this was 7 a.m. in the morning, the hospital had told me I had six hours to live because of the nature of the head injury that I'd had. Now, I shared eight needles with six people that day in Bali because they just didn't have any idea how to handle all of that. But I had something inside of me that was bigger than the situation that I was in. And there was something inside of me that had me know that if I trusted myself, that I would be okay. But if I trusted someone else, I couldn't know the outcome. Does that make sense? So I made the decision that I wouldn't be operated on, regardless of their threats that I'd be dead in six hours. And that was at one o'clock in the afternoon, I should have been gone. By 10.30 that night, I'd boarded a flight in Bali, so I was still alive, and then I flew for six hours, landed in Sydney, and then I was operated on for eight hours. So very miraculous. And they gave me disprin to keep me alive on the plane, which I thought was really considerate. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the real power in the story, or the real power in that experience was that you know, it was about six or so years later that I was having a moment. I'd lost my dog, Dolly, and I rang my dad and I said to him, Father, I said, I just don't know what to do anymore. I said, Dolly's dead. I'd had her for 15 years. She was my little fluffy munchkin face. And I said, and I just don't know what to do. And he's, my dad calls me Buffy. I know it's being recorded and it's out there now. <laughs> so my dad calls me Buffy and I was 36. And he says, come sit on daddy's lap, daddy, tell your story. Yes, daddy, tell you. I've got the best dad in the world. And he said, Buffy, think of the humble little caterpillar. He goes about life thinking he's awesome because he can bulldoze over a blade of grass. And he said, but life occurs and instinct takes over and he begins to spin his chrysalis. And inside of that chrysalis, he's transforming and his life is hell and he's wondering, he never signed up for this at all. But inside of that chrysalis, as he's transformed, that there is not the fight of his life. My dad said to me, Buffy, you're the same. He said, going through Bali, and going through Greg's suicide, that's not the fight of your life. If you think that's it, you're wrong. He said, the fight of your life is becoming extraordinary because of it. And he said, and it's kind of like that butterfly. No one can help it. No one can cut the chrysalis and no one can make it easier for him because as soon as they do, he'll lose the strength in his wings and he won't be able to catch the wind underneath them and see the world from a different perspective. <sighs> Did my dad nail it? Oh, shut the front door. You know, it was exactly what I needed to hear at exactly the right time. But sometimes you just get those stories and my dad totally nailed it. It was enough to completely shift my mindset to really thinking about, hang on a second, what if I survived for a reason? And the reason was so that I could be the most beautiful butterfly that I'm capable of being. And what if I'm supposed to see the world from a different vantage point? Maybe that's why I survived. I went there to take my life, but I was the only one who came home. This is the science about what's happening. What we know that Roundup Glyphosate and all the 500 products in Australia are doing. So the IRAC said that it's a possible carcinogen non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Court cases prove that. It collates these minerals that you see above. Sulfur, iron, copper, zinc, calcium, manganese, cobal cobalum, manganese, uh, manganese uh, what else have I got? Molybdenum and selenium. Now I want to show you something. There are 299, 291 enzymes that glyphosate will downregulate because it doesn't allow those minerals to go into the coenzyme or to get into the enzyme. That is frightening. So there are 291 that we know. One of them is glutamate synthesis. Another one is, um, which we'll be talking about, is the shikimate pathway. Now, 
we make, do most of these enzyme pathways, but we don't do the shikimate pathway. And this is how glyphosate has got its foot into the door. So the shikimate pathway is done by bacteria, fungi and plants. It produces tyrosine, phenylalanine and tryptophan. They are three amino acids that we need to eat in order to make the proteins that we need to make for our neurotransmitters. Things that make us think, that don't give us anxiety or depression or no, no autism or al no Alzheimer's or dementia. We need these and yet they are being destroyed out of plants because the shikimate pathway is not being produced. It also produces coenzyme Q10 as well as, now I've got iron up there but it's actually um, enterobacter which is an iron carrier. So it stops that being produced and folic acid. Don't you find it odd? In 2009 um, they put folic acid into our foods and they'd been spraying glyphosate that was pulling, stopping the shikimate pathway from happening. I remember when I was listening to um, Dr. Stephanie Seneff and she kept going, the shikimate, 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 shikimate. And I finally went, Stephanie, what the frick is the shikimate pathway? But when you understand the shikimate pathway and your gut bacteria make 90% of your tyrosine, tryptophan and phenylalanine, and if they're not making it, then you don't get it and you can't make your neurotransmitters. We have an increase in nervous system problems that are happening. It's an antibiotic to your microbiome. And if you're eating it every single day in your breakfast cereals, your breads, your toast, your cheeses and everything like that, then you will be slowly eroding. The only two that they've figured out are resistant to it, which is really scary, is clostridia difficult. And you know what diff stands for, difficult because it's hard to get rid of, as well as salmonella. And what about all the salmonella poisonings that we're seeing now on cucumbers and lettuce and all these things? It damages the epithelial tight junctions of not only the gut, the blood-brain barrier, the blood vessels, but the kidney tubules. Which means this, is that you have an open gate and everything that comes in, the food that you put into your body, undigested proteins, viruses, bacteria, enter into your body without any stopping because it opens those gates up. And then if you've got heavy metals, those then head up into the blood, the blood brain, uh, the brain, the blood brain barrier is compromised, it then goes into the brain. And we wonder why we have brain fog. We wonder why we have all these mental issues that we're seeing today. In my, in everything I've done, and I'm a, you know, I'm the biggest foodie of all, I believe that this is the straw that's broke the camel's back. And if we can do something about it, how many are in here? 600, maybe 500? I don't know how many are in here. Can you imagine if you go back to your community and you start to educate people about this, the changes that we can actually make? Uh, okay, other things is it enhances the damaging effect of other foodborne um, chemical residues. So clopyrifos, which is a pesticide, has just been banned because it causes brain developmental problems in a developing brain. But it's been sprayed on our food. Pregnant mother drinks or eats or drinks whatever's got in it and then that damages the development of the brain. I hope I'm making you mad because that's my purpose is to get you angry so that you do something. So down regulates vitamin D. You wonder why we've got a vitamin D problem. Destroys the ecology of the soil. Uh, it also um, harms embryonic and umbilical cells. That's more science. Um, inhibits methionine. I, I always wonder if this MTHFR has nothing to do with that. It's the methylation process is being um, downgraded because we don't have the minerals in it to make the enzymes so we can't keep going. So it's, it's a question that I've got. Uh, it replaces glycine in the amino acid chain. Because remember, it's a glycine. It's an amino acid with a methyl and a phosphonate. So it's replacing glycine, and, and this is a theory, it's not been proven, but it's a theory that Dr. Stephanie Seneff is working on that it's replacing glycine in the amino acid chain. So for enzymes that are glycine, 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 and then it might have another couple of amino acids, that's going to create a problem. So she's trying to correlate them at the moment. Suppresses the liver, cytochrome um, P450 enzyme. She kept saying that to me, and I still really don't understand it, but it, I do understand this, that it impairs bile flow. 
hmm, interesting how many people are getting their gallbladders out. You, you just have to think of the practicalities of what have happened. Impairs um, activation of vitamin D, which we talked about. Impairs clearance of um, retoic acid, leading to congenital developmental disorders such as spina bifida. And we put folic acid in. We've been warned. So I'm going to speak to you today about what is the ramifications for you if you continue to not know where your food is coming from and not make a hard stand about what you're consuming. Because I can't change you. I can just give you the information. I can change myself. I don't want you to be stuck in the, the crap that's happening. Know it, yes. Be aware of it, yes. But bring your vibration up so that we can vibrate at a higher level and collectively we might be able to bring everybody up to make those changes. So the wheat fields were once where we used the straw for the animal and the grain for ourselves. And a wheat field was in, within a paddock, not a big monoculture. And we used to prepare our wheat in a sourdough type of way, in that we fermented it. And the fermentation process helped break down any anti-nutrients that may be in it. And it was like a three-day process in which we, we did it. But back in the 1930s, things started to change in the 1920s and 30s. And Dr. Kellogg's, who was the beginning of Kellogg's cornflakes, uh, was a more a plant-based diet and he created a difference with grain and then he dried it. Um, he knew that we couldn't digest it properly so he, he did it into a way that you know we could digest it. But the problem was is that from that day forward we began to make a lot of shelf stable foods. Look at your breakfast cereal aisles, they're, they're just unbelievable and when you read the ingredients of these breakfast cereal aisles, you, you, you kind of go, well, what is in there that is any good? You know, it's based on sugars and um, fortified vitamins and minerals and, and all sorts of things. So food fortification started in the 1920s and it started with iodine being put into our salt. From there, we started to realize that there were gaps in B vitamins, such as um, when we had diseases as beriberi and pellagra. So the B vitamins started to be put into our flowers and to everything. But what are these vitamins and minerals? They're not vitamins from food and they're not minerals from food. They're minerals that are basically from mines. In actual fact, if you get some breakfast cereal and grind it and get a magnet, you'll pull the iron out of it. It's not what we should be eating. We don't lick our cars for our nutrition, so why would we do that? It's really important that given that we're in the wellness industry and we all are in love with wellness and we're all in love with nutrition or we're in love with fermentation or we're all in love with CrossFit or we're in love with whatever it is, that we don't go so hardcore as to alienate ourselves to make ourselves look like not the normal because we are actually the normal. The ones that are sick out there are the abnormal. What is it that we're trying to achieve when we go on this wellness journey? So some people are trying to achieve a symptom change. So some people might be trying to achieve some comfort in the gastrointestinal system. Anyone trying to achieve comfort in the gastrointestinal system? You've got to remember that if you're cooking food, you want to love it. And so when you get to prepare your meals, you don't want to hate it. You don't want to be thinking, oh my gosh, this is so oh, just, I don't want to have to prepare another meal for my husband who doesn't appreciate it. I don't have to prepare another meal for my wife who just doesn't care. She just wants, you know, peanut butter on toast. I don't, I don't you know, you want to love it so much and you want to change your consciousness around it so that you just enjoy it so much. You've got to remember that if you're cooking food, you want to love it. You know, you want to love it so much and you want to change your consciousness around it so that you just enjoy it so much. And if, if the company that you're keeping at home isn't fantastic around your mealtime, invite someone to come and join you. That'll get some conversation going. So I will, at any opportunity, cook someone a meal and I love it. I love it. And I think I've had to change my mindset around it because back in 1992, I didn't know how to cook. In fact, I ate really poorly, as many of you would know. But I now love it so much that when I go to prepare something, it becomes magical. 
and the energy from the food jumps out of the bowl or out of the plate and when we're serving it up it just has so much more colour because I love preparing it and I know that everyone who's eating it absolutely loves it. Even the bits that they don't want to eat, they love eating them because I love making them. Does that make sense? So you start in stress, and, and if you're stressed enough, that means you, you care enough. Like if you're stressed, you care. If you're not stressed, you don't really care. So if people go, oh no, I'm not really stressed, it probably is that you don't really care. When you're stressing out, like when you're overwhelmed a little bit, um, that's when things start to get a little bit out of control because you're now not managing stress. So you'll graduate from stress into overwhelm and that graduation process into overwhelm is where things start to go wrong. This is where we start to get disconnected from ourselves. And so at any cost, you don't want to become disconnected to yourself or from yourself. Because at that point, you start to lose compassion. So as you start to lose compassion, um, we start to lose the ability to show compassion. You start to be, I suppose, less tolerant of other people and less tolerant of ideas. And that's, uh, that's pretty ordinary. So if you start to be overwhelmed, you start to disengage because life becomes more about you rather than the things that you're stressed about. So PC said to me, Damo, I would love you to open the wellness summit. I've gone, wow, okay, yep, and uh, that's really good. I'd love to. And, um, and so I, I thought for a while, I thought, what do we need to hear? What do we need to hear? Because a couple of years ago, I um, actually, almost every summit that we've had, I've broken some kind of news. Like we broke the coconut oil news. You don't cook with coconut oil. Who remembers that one? Who's still with me about that one? Yeah. <laughs> Um, we, we spoke about the contraceptive pill, we've uh, spoken about microbiome, we've done a whole lot of different things and, and the thing that I've, I've uh, I suppose reflected on over this last two years of being out of the summit and kind of not being involved in, in these big audiences is kind of where wellness is heading. And you guys are champions of it and you guys are all in there and you're in the trenches and, and we're all doing you know, the best we possibly can to be able to share um, the message and to be able to help everybody you know, go well. So this little caterpillar um, spends the first part of his life and he's growing and uh, he's on a tree somewhere or maybe he's in a garbage tin somewhere um, and just eating scraps. And he hopes one day he's going to be a butterfly or a moth. He's not too sure what he's going to turn into. Just wrap himself up into a cocoon and, and off he'll go. Along the way he'll get some information. He'll, uh, he'll pick up pieces of food and he'll eat that. Some of that food will be good for him. Some of that food will be bad for him. He'll start to have an experience. It's unlikely he'll have diarrhea. It's unlikely he'll have constipation. He won't have irritable bowel syndrome or leaky gut. It's highly likely he could have depression because his mates die early. Um, but it's, uh, it's highly likely that he's going to have some kind of an experience on the planet, albeit pretty short. His end goal, his end goal is to turn into something that could fly. It's kind of nice, isn't it? Really nice. Anyway, so he wraps himself up in a little cocoon. He's had his meal and uh, he ends up coming out of, of the cocoon and he turns into a moth. A little bit disappointed by that. He was hoping he'd be a butterfly. Uh, he, you know, he's flying around late one night and there's a lot of lights around and he flies around and he flies into the podiatrist. And he goes into the podiatrist and, uh, and the podiatrist says, can I help you? And he says, yeah, um, I'm, I'm here to see you. And he, he said, well, what, what, what are you doing here? And he said, well, can we go into your room? And so he goes and sits down in his room. And so the moth and the podiatrist are chatting away. Could be the barefoot podiatrist, I'm not sure. But anyway, he goes in there and he says, uh, I'm a bit confused. You know, life's pretty tough. You know, I had hoped I was going to be a butterfly. I'd read all this information if I ate these leaves and if I climbed this particular tree and if I, uh, I did X, Y, and Z and I saw all this stuff, I heard that I'd become a butterfly. My mum, I understand, she got hit by a car the other day and she's dead. My best mate, he flew into a bug zapper. Like, life's just a bit crappy. So I've been searching for information and that's why I'm here. And the podiatrist says, well, I'm a podiatrist and I think you actually need to see a psychologist. How can you came here to see the podiatrist? And the moth said, well, the light was on. <coughs> now, <coughs> the reason I tell that story 
because we see that mirrored in wellness. And this is where I want to get to because you're going to learn a lot of stuff this weekend. We're going to learn a lot of stuff. It's like the drunk guy who's walking home from the bar, from the pub, and he drops his keys somewhere and he's looking around everywhere, he's trying to find it. And he goes and he sees there's a lamppost. He looks underneath the lamppost and he goes, I can't find my keys. And he's looking under the lamppost because that's where the light is, but that's not where his keys are going to be. But he only went to where the light was. We see that in wellness. In wellness, what we've got is we've got some amazing experts, and you'll see many of them this weekend, this weekend. And then we've got a whole bunch of people that don't know a whole lot that have got unbelievable Instagram accounts. Unbelievable. And they're spreading information. And there's still people out there that still believe that you can cook with coconut oil on high heat and still come out okay. And that's just the ignorance of what the research and the science tells us. So that means that there's people out there that are in the wellness industry still telling you information that's not true. And that concerns me. So I know that this weekend you're going to be exposed to some amazing information. I'd love you to just culture that and just try to think about what it actually means. Because there are things that we can't change, there's things that we can change and there might be some things that we're not sure about. But anyone else in the room spend time worrying about things they can't change. When there's things that you can't change, are they, does that usually like stay as a little small problem? Or usually if, if they start small, what do they look like by the end of the day? They become massive and yet we can't do anything about them. So if it comes into a, a the zone of things we can't change, it's about accepting them and understanding that it's, it's outside of our control and acknowledging that fact. On the other end, there is things we can change. I know there's lots of you in the room today that have set new projects and goals that you want to be achieving. And now what it's about for you is taking a big, bold step towards moving towards the life that you're designing and that you're dreaming about. Does that make sense? Now, in the middle is stuff that you might not be sure about whether you can or can't change it. You're really not sure. And so that's where actually finding a trusted advisor, whether that's a health professional, whether that's a best friend, family member, to help you decide whether it's something you can't change or whether it's something you can change is so important. When it comes to stress, I think it's really, the way we can also simplify those 50 different worries is to put them into different categories. And when it comes to stress, there's three types. Physical, chemical, and emotional. And whatever's going on in your world right now, you can probably put it into one of those three categories. Do you see how we're going from 50 down into three different categories and it's simplifying? So if you've got family stress right now, which bucket would that sit in? Emotional. You've been sitting on chairs that if you're upstairs, they're not that comfortable. I'm impressed you've stayed there all the, all the time. Like really, I had to move. Um, not comfy. What stress would that fit under? Physical, yeah? And this weekend, the nutrition and the nourishment that we've had has been phenomenal. But say you were eating an overly processed diet, obviously not here this weekend, but when you go home tonight or tomorrow, what bucket would that fit into? Chemical. Okay, so again, we're simplifying so that when we're re-entering life, as you go home tonight, you're flying into state, going home tomorrow, is that all of a sudden you go from this complicated world into simplifying it, and then you can see whether you can't change it, can change it, or you need some help to figure out which one that sits in. But what I want you to do is actually picture your phone in front of you. Can you all point to where your social media icons and your email are, please? Like, I actually want you to point, where is it on your phone? If you had your phone in front of you, I would put money on it that every single one of you in this room knows muscle memory exactly where it is. I know where mine is, it's right there. It's in my social media box and my emails are there. And come back to that in a second, why that's so important, that you actually have an awareness of how ingrained that is into your system. Because do you think our overconnectedness might be complicating our lives a little? Does anybody else use their phone as their alarm? 
few hands going up and around the room. Some of you are like, I'm not sure if I should admit to that. Some of you will have your phone close enough that it's one of the first things that you can get. Now, what did I ask you to do before? Point to where all your social media is. If your phone is your alarm, what gets pressed next after you turn off your alarm? Huh? Facebook, Instagram, I don't understand Snapchat, you might have it. Emails. Good, I'm glad they're shaking of the head. I'm very glad. For some of you, you're giggling because you're like, yeah, I do that, but in a different order. <laughs> For me, my first hour of my day is my prime real estate of my day, where I want it to be internally, my safe haven, what's going on internally for me and my family. As soon as I click one of those automatic buttons, guess what I'm doing? I'm bringing the outside world and all its stresses into my safe haven. So now some of you are like, yeah, but I'll miss out on something on Facebook and I've seen a messenger message and they've now seen that I've seen it and now I need to answer it. Because, <laughs> oh my God, they've seen I'm active <laughs> and they're gonna be offended. They're the same people you would ignore their phone call if it came through. You'd let it go to the voicemail, but oh my God, they've seen I'm active on Facebook. Um, I've tried all my life to be really healthy. I've been highly motivated. Um, used to be a gym instructor, aerobics instructor, showing my age now, right? And so that meant eating a low-fat diet, uh, low-fat, high carbohydrate, with lots and lots and lots of exercise. It also involved working very hard, partying very hard, and not really placing any emphasis on rest. You know, that's not very productive, is it? You need to be doing something with your time. Be productive, work, work, work. So that's what I did. And I lived that way for 25 years until I went on to really test my system by giving birth to these two amazing humans, my children, Sam and Millie. In March 2014, I hit rock bottom. I had chronic nausea, so it was a little bit like morning sickness with a chaser of a hangover, you know, that really feeling. I had all the digestive systems you could think, couldn't poo, couldn't sleep, had no sex drive, which wasn't good in a marriage, and my overwhelm, my um, default feeling was just one of overwhelm to the point where I couldn't really cope with doing the laundry and what was I going to make for dinner again tonight, for God's sake? So it wasn't a very nice place to be and my world got very small, as you can imagine. And I, um, yeah, well, it wasn't good. So in a desperate attempt to reset my health, I turned to a paleo diet. I was like, this, what is this crazy stuff? No grains, no gluten, no dairy, no legumes, no alcohol, no sugar. I was like, this is crazy. But I was so, so sick. I thought, I'll do this for a bit, and then I'll just go back to my low-fat diet, right? <laughs> Little did I know. I couldn't believe how much better I felt after such a short space of time. So I, was, I changed my diet, I tweaked my lifestyle, so I put a bit of emphasis on sleep, which was pretty good, pretty good advice. And nature and connection, and um, yeah, wow, it felt so good. No matter how you're feeling right now, with a few dietary changes, a few lifestyle tweaks, and a good community behind you, you too can achieve anything. I never would have thought that I would be flying around the country, standing on stage, and turning my vision for Primal Alternative into a reality. Wellness of your wealth is pretty important. I've been coaching people one-on-one -on -one, um, for 17 years, and I thought it was going to be easy. I thought we'd sit down and go, listen, you know, save some more money than you spend, Sandra, uh, Sandy, um, and, you know, put some of that money towards something that's an asset, and it'll be sweet. I thought it was very one-dimensional. That's how, how wrong I was, all right? Because money um, is quite an interesting subject. It's quite a touchy subject. It's one of the big four that, that you're told is rude to talk about. What are the big four that's rude to talk about at a dinner party? Money, politics, religion, and sex, right? They, they're probably the most important things we bloody should be talking about, right? They impact your life no end, right? It's rude to ask about money. Why, that guy's rich. I wanna know what he did. 
you know, that's what you should be doing, right? Um, hiding in the corner, um, uh, uh, Brene Brown's thing is shame hides in dark places, right? Okay, shine a light on this stuff. Like, and for me, that was um, beginning with my health and understanding about that and eventually having these money conversations. I've been sitting across the table from grown people um, and we started to talk about a budget and all of a sudden their whole life came out. All right? And so for me, it's a very, very personal thing to have those conversations because to share some of the things in our money stories connects to all sorts of places in our life. Anyone know what I'm talking about there? Yeah. There's one of these uh, crazy facts that most, uh, most Australians who don't manage their money are between two and four weeks away from um, uh, financial um, uh, ruin. Yes. Okay, and here's what I'm here to tell you after 20 years of uh, talking about wealth and money. All right? It's actually really important. And there's a truth which is completely the opposite that you must hold at the same time. It's actually completely irrelevant. All right? Because if you're so obsessed with it being right, and you're not okay with it being nothing, then that, that causes problems and grief, okay? Because when you're obsessed with the outcome, as certainly in wealth and money, um, uh, when you are afraid of losing things, anyone know what I'm talking about here? When you're afraid of losing things, and you make decisions in fear and being afraid, those decisions um, are useless, you know? If you make decisions in stress and pressure, you should never do that, they're bad decisions. Our intellect um, drops over 60% when um, the stress hormones are in, in and around our body and our brain. So. You don't get taught it at school, you don't get taught it at home, um, you don't get taught it at work. You know, when, do, when are we going to get taught some of this stuff? Um, you know, and I think it's a pretty important message to bring out um, into the world. So, you know, it's very sadly, the stats show that there's not many people who understand um, the dollars and cents of it. You know, uh, only one person ends up sort of wealthy and, you know, only a few financially secure. Um, and uh, very sadly, Marcus was saying we're in the top for wellness, Long longevity, um, and we're pretty sh for money. 36% of people over the age of 65 live in relative poverty in Australia financially. It's hideous. Worst in the developed world, okay? So for me, I think that's my thing that I'm gonna take on, that's part of my purpose. If I can help people change that, okay, then, then that's why I like to do it. But why is that so? Why uh, don't people uh, change their financial capacity? And over the years, sitting with thousands and thousands and thousands of people, um, um, there's a few things that are pretty obvious to me, right? We have some problems, some financial challenges and problems, some symptoms to our illness of our wealth that we don't uh, pay attention to, okay? And some of them are taxes. Anyone know about taxes? Anyone remember the first time you, you received the paycheck and you're like, yeah, I'm getting paid, and then you look down and there's somebody, some prick has taken some money out, and you're like, where did it all go? And you're like, yeah, that's taxes. What do I get for that? Oh, I don't know. What, who knows, right? Taxes, uh, your home loan. There's, there's an idea. You know, uh, grow up, go to uni, get a hex debt. Um, then you can go and get married, um, have kids, buy a house, pay it off, and then you'll be what? Old, right? You won't be wealthy, okay? A home loan, you pay it off over 30 years. Here's one tip you should take home today. Uh, everybody needs to change their home payment to weekly or fortnightly, right now. Everybody, today, okay? That will save you six years off your home loan just by changing it, the frequency, six years off your home loan and save you hundreds of thousands of dollars of interest. Right there, there's 50, or $100,000 extra money in the next uh, 24 years that'll go back in your pocket. Just one thing, why doesn't the bank tell you that? Because they're not in the interest of, interest in making you wealthy, they're in the interest of making themselves wealthy. They've got no interest in telling you that, okay? I think that should be investigated myself bad debts, all that sort of thing. Your numbers, understanding where your tax rate is and what you can do about it. I'm gonna go through a little bit of technical stuff just quickly now. Um, super, who thinks the, the pension's gonna take care of them? <laughs> yeah, no. Right, what's the age of the pension right now? 67, okay. Um, they are already talking to make it to 70. Anyone under the age of 40 here? I doubt if it will be 75 or 80. 
the pension. Just so you know, most people on the pension um, are very close to or under the poverty line, so the pension's not gonna do it. You're super. You work for 40 or 50 years. Average Australian male, at age 55, $128,000 in their super. Now that will not last very long, okay? Um, and ladies, you guys are, are sadly in the worst financial shape, right? Because we do have the children and do other things and very unfairly and unfortunately, you are paid less for the same job that men are paid and that, that sucks. One thing I'm really proud of is in my leadership team, um, my women are paid more and I've got more of them on my leadership team and they earned it because they're the best. Credit cards, guys, they are the crack cocaine. They are the worst thing to your financial wellness ever. Get off them. If you're on the ice, if you're on this gear, get off. All right? Okay? Hey? Even if you pay it off every month. Yes. You know why? Because that's how you feel you are safe. You're safe and I can go to the drug. No, have $10,000 of savings in your account at any one time. I call it moving the zero line, right? We don't react, right, until our bank account is at zero. You should be reacting when your bank account's at 20,000 going, something's wrong. Uh, everyone following me so far, right? We have to move our zero line financially up the tree when it comes to uh, your financial wellness. So if we, a uh, $10,000 credit card ruins your ability to borrow money by $100,000, okay? Even if it's not paid, even if it's paid off. One of the greatest things I'd love to share with you this weekend is when you leave here with all this knowledge, one of the worst things that you could do is walk out of here and go and tell everybody what they should be doing, yes or yes. And how many of you have ever been around people that walk out of something like this and then tell you all the things you should be doing? Do you want to hear it? So I would ask you to leave here. The one message I'd love to give you is that you leave here as the example, not the evangelist. Does that make sense? completely relate to the fact that I have two very naughty teenagers, but they're also phenomenal. I have a daughter who is living her absolute dream in the Queensland National Ballet, and I have a son who walked into my room the other night while I was on a business call. He's 17, and it's all about looking buff. It's all about the look and how he is, and he comes in there from the gym, and he stands there, and he goes, I mean, look, look, look at it. And I'm on the phone going, yeah, and he goes, I mean, look, like this. And then he's lifted up his top and he's squeezing that. And I'm going, yeah, I can. He goes, when are we masking? He wants to know when he was putting on a mask next. So I'm just sharing with you that the more you live your truth and the more that you do these things, the more they get to live by your example. One of the great... Wake up. You are where you're at right here, right now because of all the choices you have made up to this point. So rather than saying, oh, oh, I feel so fat, I feel so ugly, I'm not good enough on all these stories, and then go and have a packet of Tim Tams because you think stuff would have ruined my diet anyway, and I might as well have a glass bottle of wine while I'm at it because now I'm really peeved with myself. Then you get into bed and go and beat yourself up even more and wake up, I'll start again tomorrow morning, but I'll do it with a coffee. And then at morning tea you have your muffin, and then at lunch you have your sandwich, and then in the evening you have your afternoon, you think, oh my God, I'm so tired, I have some cheese, I might as well have cheese with my wine, and then and it's all over again. Then you think, I might as well have dessert now because I've really screwed up. So then you get to bed the next night, and then you wake up and you think, today's a new day. And here's where it can change. This ritual alone has changed lives around the world, people that have followed this ritual. I have done this since I was 19 years of age, and I can promise you hand on heart, I have never missed a day. So every morning I come out and I put, after my shower, I put my little bowl of oil into, uh, oil into my bowl, about a teaspoon of carrier oil, jojoba, sweet almond, macadamia, put three drops of my essential oils, couple of sprays of magnesium in there, stand there naked, and as I dip and rub and put it on, I go, oh, you're such nice little legs, you did so well on that walk this morning, I love you. <laughs> now some of you might not have had the insides of your thighs touched lately, so now's a good time to get to know them. All right, so we're working there. Now, if you've got a thing called cellulite, either you are going to eat grilled chicken and broccoli for the next 20 weeks and that'll help get rid of it, or else let's just embrace it because we had some raw cake last night and we loved eating that raw cake. So we're going to love that little thing called cellulite or anything else. 
I think Damien said it last year, anything beginning with C and ending with an E usually causes cellulite. Think about it. Coffee, cheese, cake. Think about it. Anyway, so into the tummy in a clockwise direction. I then dip, put it in here, up for bigger. It's usually when my husband comes and goes, do you need a hand? So we're coming in here. Into the arms. This is an all over hug, the way I start my morning. And then here's the key. I stand there with those beautiful aromas and I'll say something like this. I am a great mum. I'm a good businesswoman. I'm a hot lover. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> say whatever you want. Just say something nice. Here's the thing, because I know in this room there's a group of you, there'll be some of you in this room right here that are going through a tough time. And here's what I say to stay in the authentic self. God, give me the courage, grace, strength, and dignity to get through this. Moment by moment, day by day, this too shall pass. So look after yourself, be kind to who you are as you are going through this beautiful daily ritual of self-care. Could anybody try that on tomorrow morning? This is my beautiful wife. She is an angel, my angel sent from heaven. We found a massive sunflower field in France a few weeks or months ago, whenever it was, and we pulled off the side of the road because Sarah said, I want to get a photo in the field. Not of the field, in the field. There were bee stings, there were tears. That was that moment. You think it looks romantic and amazing, but it was stressful and frenetic. That's the truth, right? That's life. It wasn't like that. What I love about this, what I love about this, we, wouldn't have, we, went, we went away for six weeks. We had Icaria and on either side we had three weeks. And my beautiful wife, she's at home with the kids right now, okay? I go, shit, how'd she do it? I'd go nuts. But she loves it. She loves it. Yes, it's hard. It's hard work. But she made an unpopular choice, a courageous choice. And I thought about this when I was putting these slides together. We couldn't have gone away for six weeks if Sarah was working as a chiropractor, stressed out, not happy, but working and bringing in more money and all of the rest of it. We earn less money, but way more fulfillment. Way more fulfillment. Because we're not using her, what is it, her professional income, but we almost get her spiritual income or whatever you want to call it. We get something far richer that we can create magic moments. That wasn't magic, but we create moments we create moments that we can all create when we're living our truth but it just takes a little bit of time a little bit of time now this isn't just what i think darwin charles darwin godfather of evolution studied barnacles anyone know what barnacles are he studied barnacles for seven years i'm serious mozart we do the seven thing when he was 21 he was, he was five when he did his first concert. He's going away, doing his concert. He goes, Dad, I'm sick of concerts. You're just using me like a puppet. You're just trying to feed the family by me playing the piano. I want to compose music. So at 21, he's off being a puppet in Vienna. He calls his dad or whatever he does back then. Says, Dad. Gets him on the iPhone, sends him a WhatsApp. Dad, I'm not coming home. I'm not, I'm not a performer. I'm a composer. I'm not your puppet anymore. You can support me or you cannot support me. Now, sadly for that story, Mozart's dad never forgave him. But I think the courage of Mozart to do what he did is something we get to enjoy every single day of the week when we're exposed to his music and the legacy of his music. Sometimes being exceptional takes a hell of a lot of courage and guts. A whole lot of G and D to really make your life the best life for you. If you're prepared to do it and give it the time to breathe, you'll never look back. So that picture is of Michael Gracie with Hugh Jackman. Michael Gracie went to the same school that I did. No one knows who he is. He's a director of The World's Greatest Showman with Hugh Jackman. Now that movie is breaking all of the records, particularly the soundtrack, which is we played that song yesterday at the beginning of the summit. I am obsessed with this movie, but I am more obsessed with the backstory behind the movie. Hugh and Michael Gracie get to know each other. Hugh says, mate, you're a ripping bloke. Let's make a movie together. Because I know you know a thing or two about music and film, and I really want to bring a, a musical, a theatrical musical to life in Hollywood. So Hugh, I uh, didn't bring it up here, Hugh Jackman believes for three years straight, he said, and you can just Google it, Hugh Jackman said, for three years, stuff all was happening, but I knew we were making this movie. 
I knew we were making this movie. Do you know how long it took Hugh Jackman and Michael Gracie to make The World's Greatest Showman from start to finish? Seven years. That's vision. That's vision. It's not just a nice conversation, right? It's vision. It's persistence. It's resilience. Even though they're dealing with millions of dollars, people didn't want to fund the movie. Oh, no, it's a musical. No one watches musicals in a, th in a, in a cinema. They might go to the theatre. It comes out and breaks all the records. So it should because they were persistent. They were persistent. How persistent are you at change? As people have set up here, you can do the four-week program with Damo and Wendy. You can do Cindy's protocol. But I'm not interested about what happens then. What happens after then? Because that's where your persistence is really tested. Really tested. So just look at this seven-year business, all right? If you're into TCM, who loves traditional Chinese medicine? Seven-year cycles, particularly the females. It's eight for men, seven for women. You can have a look at the cycles. Seven-year cycles. Saturn returns, who are the astrologists? Damo and I love talking about this. Who are the astrologists? What's Saturn returns? 28 years, 28 and a half, and every seven years there's a major, major, major development. The tumor, a tumor. How long can a tumor take to develop? Seven years, seven years. If you love a great book, read the book called Mastery by Robert Greene. It talks about an apprenticeship, a true apprenticeship, seven years before an apprentice becomes a master. Not a six month course to become a health professional. Look at Damo and Cindy. Damo's done chiropractic, naturopathy. 20 years allows him to be the rock star of wellness. 20 years. Cindy, the godmother, the grandmother, whatever I like to call it, the industry. It's time that allows that to happen. Time. Kids, those kids, they are sponges for seven years, but the example that we set, particularly over the first seven years of our children's life, is the most powerful example moving forward. And particularly if you've become a parent, you will realise how much your parents had an influence on you as you raise your kids. And sometimes you realise that it's genetic and there's nothing you can do about it. Anyway. So I ask you, are you prepared to believe in the magic of seven years? If you go, not seven years, I go, well, are you prepared to believe in the magic of just a little bit more time than seven seconds, seven weeks, seven months? You know, I think if we look at the way humans are designed, we have this amazing inbuilt mechanism to store energy. That's how we survived back in caveman days, for example. So if we think about it intellectually, it can't make sense that we would have to be eating every two hours to thrive. Do I, so I do want you to understand that that is a myth, that the eating every two hours to speed up your metabolism is funded by big food because they want your money and unfortunately they don't really care about your health. So why do we fast? There's lots of different reasons, ranging from you know, immediate benefits to lots of incredible long-term health benefits. The biggest one that I get feedback on with the clients that I work with at TNN is the digestive ease that fasting creates. A lot of us have digestive issues. You know, gut health is a really vogue topic, and rightly so. But a lot of these digestive issues are actually caused by that constant eating, that grazing all day, that snacking every two hours. Digestion is a huge energy requiring process. You know, when we eat, the blood flow goes into the gut, and that takes the blood away from the brain, which is why you might sometimes feel tired after a meal. Or for my athletes in the room, that's why things can go pear-shaped in that endurance run, in that half Ironman or in that marathon. Because if you're eating all training session or on race day, that digestive discomfort, that gastrointestinal distress that we hear about, largely comes from that delivery of the blood flow into the gut when you often need it elsewhere. And in a training environment or on race day, you need that in your legs and in your heart and in your lungs, not in your gut. 
So digestive ease is a really big one. So if you are eating a lot, if you're eating quite frequently and you're feeling you know, bloated or tired after a meal, hopefully when you take away some of my strategies today, you'll start to notice that beautiful digestive ease that comes from extending your meal to meal window and your overnight fast. So gone are the days of calorie counting and eating less and Weight Watchers and Light and Easy. It's a, as I said, fasting is a free strategy and it can be really helpful for your body compositional goals. Improved sleep. I mean, digestion, as I mentioned, is a huge energy requiring process. So if you're eating quite late, you're taking the energy again into the gut and away from those processes that the body undertakes, like producing melatonin, our sleep hormone. So it's really important to try and eat two to three hours before bed. Who manages that? Not me. <laughs> Not every day anyway, but good on you for those that do. Definitely if you are having some sleep challenges, that's the number one goal, to try and eat a couple of hours before bed. I always ask this question and I love the honesty. Who gets 3.30-itis? Like who still has that crash at 3.30 where we want sugar or caffeine or a nap underneath our desk? Yeah. So that is not a coincidence. 3.30-itis is an absolute byproduct of your food choices and particularly breakfast because how you start your day shapes your entire day. It's also not a coincidence that if you only eat a low nutrient density for breakfast that those choices flow on throughout the day. That you, f you need more carbohydrates to pick yourself back up off the floor again. And that blood sugar roller coaster unfortunately continues throughout the day. So our goal should be to have a nice stable blood sugar, which means we have control over our energy and certainly over our appetite and our hormones and our cravings. And the, and the food choices that then follow. Four years ago, I was sitting where you guys were. I was 50 kilos heavier than I am now. I was skeptical. I didn't know what I was doing there, but I just knew that I needed to make a difference in my life. It was 2014, Easter school holidays. I was with my young friends, we were trying to play footy. I say trying, because I lasted five minutes. I was sweating, I was hot, I was puffy, I was exhausted. I had to go and sit on the bench and watch my beautiful husband play with these two kids and have the time of their lives. I was exhausted, I was miserable, and I was bawling my eyes out. How was I at this point? How did I get here? What on earth had I let myself do to my body to get here. How many of you are feeling like that right now? Right? Don't have to put your hands up, it's okay. I know you're there. You might be hiding in the back somewhere, but I know you're there. How's the stories you're telling yourself going? I'm big boned, it's in my genes. My parents are big. I'm Indian, I eat rice, whatever. Okay, I'm an Indian who hates Indian food, so deal with it, people. I don't care. So let me, <laughs> sorry. So let me show you where I was at. And it's really challenging for me to share these with you. That was me. 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 One more. That's the worst one, really. I was nearly 152 kilos there. I was a type 2 diabetic. I was on six medications. I had to have an emergency hysterectomy, which ended up having me on insulin. And I was like, how did I get there? I don't know. I was the skinniest kid growing up. I love sport. I still love sport. Go the Hawks. They won last night. So I decided I had to do something about it. I was lucky enough to be taken by some beautiful friends right there to see Cindy O'Meara for the day. And that changed my life. Changing habits. I read cover to cover. Came home to call the crap out of my fridge, pantry, kitchen. You know, low fat, diet, whatever, blah, blah, whatever. Took it all out, started eating organic, whole, gluten-free, plant-based food, and it, the weight started to release. Then I was lucky enough to go to the 2014 Wellness Summit. 
I sat where you guys are. I listened to this amazing information, these incredible speakers. I was just blown away. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about Matthew Brown. Beautiful pup here. I was 43. I just left Sydney. I ran a technology company. I had burnt out. And um, I left Sydney and I moved to Brisbane. And one of my goals was that I was going to get a dog. And I took my bonsai. I left a husband behind. I left a technology business behind. And I said to myself, I need to take some time to find myself again. And I moved to Brisbane and I got my dog and I got a beautiful place that needed some gardening. And this beautiful thing here was six months old when the vet said to me, we need to put her down. I had purchased a property that was really, really hilly. And what I found very, very quickly was Murphy Brown was struggling with severe hip dysplasia. So she was finding it very, very hard to walk at night. And by the end of the day after we'd gardened, because I took a couple of years off too, I was able to do that, um, she would pretty much drag her back and legs in the house, and it was really distressing. And so the vet said to me, you know, her x-rays are so bad that we really do need to put her down. Hip, replacing her hips, breaking her hips at one year old, and replacing them won't work because she's just so bad. We need to put her on anti-inflammatories, I was spending $250 a month on drugs for her, but that's the thing to do. And I said to myself, no way. How can I put down this beautiful creature? But I didn't want her to suffer either. So I started researching a whole lot of stuff. And I knew a lot about um, health and wellbeing, and I'll talk to that in a moment. But um, I got a phone call from my sister Desiree. So my older sister Desiree rang me and she said to me, Sis, I know that you're really distressed about Murphy. She said, I know this is going to sound crazy. She said, but have you tried water? I'm standing there rolling my eyes, right? I knew a lot about alkalinity and I knew a lot about a host of other things. But she said to me, have you tried water? And she said, I've heard this water from Japan. They're having remarkable result with people who are suffering with different um, joint issues, etc." But have you, have you looked at that? And I thought to myself, water? Water's just water. What difference can water make? The swelling and the discomfort that she's feeling, I can help. I know through diet, through alkaline foods, etc., I can address that. But I hadn't heard about water. And my sister Deirdre rings me and says, you need to look at this. And I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to do this. I've got a system. Um, this water from Japan. And I started giving Murphy the water. And it was incredible. It was absolutely remarkable. And instead of crawling to bed at night, she started actually having energy. And I took her to uh, Reiki Masters and I gave her all of the, and um, chiropractic and acupuncture. She had all of that. And took her off all of the drugs. And she was incredible. And Murphy Brown, have you got the picture of I Murphy do. Brown? I There's Murphy. <laughs> she lived 11 and a half years, and any one of the energy healers I took her to said that she was just pure love. It was just absolutely beautiful. Yeah. She was such a gift. Thank you. It was six years before my little sister was diagnosed with brain cancer. She'd given birth to her fifth child, on the side of the road, on the way to a hospital. When I got a phone call, I was running my technology company in Sydney, um, and I got a phone call to say that she'd given birth to her fifth child, Maya, on the side of the road, and she was not well. The baby was in intensive care, and my sister couldn't get out of bed. And I was in this power mode, and I said, well, what do you mean my sister's not well? What help is she getting? I got on an aeroplane because I could, and I flew back. I walked into the hospital, I walked into my little sister's room. She hadn't been able to get out of bed, and this is 24 hours after she'd given birth. She hadn't been able to get out of bed, and um, I walked into her room, and I looked at her, and there was this blackness in her eyes. And as I looked at her, I saw it, there was, it was just dark, and I knew she was not well. And she looked at me and she said, Sis, I cannot get out of bed without collapsing, and I haven't even seen my new baby yet. I march out 
talk to the nurses and I say, where's the doctor? She hadn't seen a doctor yet. She had not seen a doctor yet. Where's the doctor? She's not well. I'm telling you right now, my little sister is not well. They said, well, no, it doesn't work that way. I said, I don't care how it works. She's not well, believe me. Anyway, within an hour and a half, we had a, a doctor come and look at her. Within three hours, they were organising a flight for her to Auckland because they'd done some emergency x-rays and they had discovered that 25% of her brain was uh, covered in a tumour. So um, she goes into um, surgery, they debulk the brain tumour and they say she's got three months to live. Palliative care, that's all we can do for you. I don't think so. And I started researching, and this is before the internet, right? The internet was just coming out, because this is in the 90s, 96, 97. I started researching everything I possibly could. I read all of the books, I read everything, and I got shark cartilage and I got barley grass, because I'd been taking barley grass personally since I was 25. So I figured I'd throw that in, because I knew it was really alkaline and I felt good with it. And we started feeding her reishi mushrooms and a whole host of things, everything we could do. And she went into remission. Now, I had my dog on barley grass and turmeric and a whole host of alkaline stuff mixed in with her food because I knew a whole lot about that. I know through diet, through alkaline foods, etc., I can address that. But I hadn't heard about water. And my sister DJ rings me and says, you need to look at this. And I thought, oh, OK, I'm going to do this. I've got a system. Um, this water from Japan. So my little sister Malipa lived 18 years. She died a few years ago, and she's got an incredible legacy, and it was just phenomenal. After my mum passed and I'd gone through the grieving process, and I'd run successful businesses and I'd run technology, I was ready to get back into doing something more with my life. Um, how could I actually make a difference in the lives of others? And I'm asking myself, if I did one thing with the rest of my life, just one thing, what would it be to help this generation of children? And at the time, we had the drought, and I'm drinking this beautiful water. At the time, there's a whole host of information on child health that I'm reading and about the trend with one in six having a respiratory issue and learning disabilities, and one in 32 children by the, by the year 2032 will be um, diagnosed with autism of some sort, right? What's going on? What could I actually do? In the schools and on the television, we've got all of these adverts, which is about cons conserving water. So we're spending tens of millions of dollars. We need to conserve water, water Tuesdays and Thursdays or Wednesdays and Thurs uh, Fridays, wherever you live. But nobody was talking about the quality of water that we were drinking. And in the schools, they were talking about grading the types of food that the children were eating to get some of the sugars, etc., out. Nobody was talking about the importance of water as a core nutrient in the body to hydrate, to help actually balance the body, conduct energy and everything else around it. And it was at that point we realised that what we wanted to do was put these into every classroom, into every school, for every child, because every child had the right to drink the best possible water. I grew up in country New Zealand drinking that water out of a spring. So that's what we wanted to do. And my business partner at the time, Vanessa, turned around and said to me, you don't have enough money to do that. <laughs> and I said, no, I don't. So how on earth do we do that? And we thought about creating a charity and a whole host of things. And then we, we realised that if we created a social business or an enterprise based on a social cause, and our social cause was, let's create a business that actually supports putting these into schools free. And we created Zazen water because every family needs great hydrating water. But most of all, if we could get this into our classrooms and educate children on the importance of drinking water as their first choice and understanding the secret of water, then that was our gift to them. <laughs>